This welding on approach is more obvious when we come to my second criterion, proactivity. Many who do teach preemptive striking in an effective way reveal the reactive nature of their base system when it comes to covering their next set of techniques. The objective observer notes that the bulk of information being taught in the class is based off reactive cues. Being proactive in a self-protection context can be defined by taking control and, if matters get physical, the use of constant forward pressure. It's not just about acting first, but about getting on the front foot as quickly as possible and staying there until there's no longer a threat. Self-protection's core lesson is about taking charge, which underlines the importance of attitude. When you're trying to survive, you're taking total responsibility for your own well-being, never relying on anyone else, least of all your attacker. A distinguishing feature of an assault is the relentless ferocity of one person against another. Rarely do we see anything like this in even the most intense match fights. The dynamic of the counter-assault is to get onto the front foot and relentlessly overwhelm the enemy until he's no longer a threat. There is no exchange, there is no feigning or drawing. Ideally, the defender preempts with the strike and then follows the strike with an uninterrupted rapid flow of similar attacks until an exit point can be safely accessed or until the attacker is subdued. Strikes may have to vary according to the attacker's reactions with the defender performing something I call an incidental combination. However, this isn't the usual set of orchestrated strikes designed to set up another boxer. Rather, adjustments are made as the attacker tries to recover or return fire. There is no pacing. The counter-assault is totally explosive and anaerobic in nature. If grappling or anti-grappling is necessary for whatever reason, similar principles apply and no assumptions regarding what the attacker will do in defence should be made. Unless an effective restraining, disabling or stranglehold or choke is clearly achieved, these anti-grappling and grappling tactics are generally used so that the defender might start striking and follow the same plan as previously outlined. Likewise, even if the defender hasn't been able to preempt their attacker and they somehow haven't been incapacitated, everything will be about regaining the initiative using such counter-offensive positions like the cover to get back onto the front foot. If the fight begins or ends up on the ground, the defender's tactics are linked to the main proactive plan. Whenever possible, the defender should seek positions that reduce their chances of becoming unnecessarily wrapped up on the ground. Certain ground pins, such as side control and the mount, have their place and are extremely effective in one-on-one -on -one fights. However, they expose the defender's back to other antagonists. The person being pinned need only to cling on to the person doing the pinning, and now the person in the normally dominant position becomes a sitting target. Pins, such as the neon stomach position, are a safer option, as they put the defender in a half-standing position with more room to monitor other threats. Unless control and restraint is the order of the day, the defender's priority is to transition from any pin back into a standing position. To say fights cannot be finished on the ground, there aren't situations when this is a valid option, but the priority of self-defence is safety, and the longer one is engaged in a potentially dangerous situation, the more likely matters will go south. I stress this from a survival perspective, and also a legal one. Prolonging a pin not only increases the risk of involvement from other antagonists, but it becomes increasingly difficult to justify self-defence in the eyes of the law. Fighting from underneath, either in an asymmetrical or symmetrical ground fight situation, the priority remains to get back to the feet. The defender looks to proactively disengage. This might sound like an oxymoron, but it's more than a tactical retreat. Everything about the disengagement is about the defender fighting the way back to a standing position. In the case of symmetrical ground fighting, disengagement might not be immediately viable in which case sweeping or turning the antagonist might be a better option. Then the defender should go back to the pinning tactics. Failing this, choking or joint locking is the last resort. Even so, these submission holes should usually be used to effect a sweep. You get the picture. Every situation should be regarded as a momentary detour from the inevitable objective. With this in mind, the defender is less likely to be reactive in their approach, even when they haven't been able to preempt their antagonist. Weapons escalate risks. Tactics might need to be adapted, but principles largely remain the same. Deal with weapons, like training children, should make the self-protection teacher think more realistically about their civilian teaching programmes. The first thing it should immediately bring into focus is that, yet again, soft skills are incredibly important. Raising the stakes of the threat to a capable aggressor armed with a loaded firearm will limit the defender by making them a child and physical violence becomes an even less desirable option. Attitude and awareness become that much more important. Soft skills set the tone for everything. It's all about taking charge whatever strategy the defender decides to adopt. Sadly, this is rarely what I see in your average weapon defense class. What I do see is a lot of incongruity. 
Suddenly, the same teacher who has preached to his students that being reactive is a recipe for disaster in an unarmed situation starts setting up scenarios where the defender waits for an offender to attack with their weapon. I've often found myself in a room full of self-defense instructors that consider themselves pragmatists and yet want to drill everything around having an attacker make a dramatic rear-hand lunge with a training knife. This is despite the fact there is an abundance of footage of crimes that rarely, if ever, show this type of assault occurring. If the risks are elevated in an armed situation, then it seems rather odd to think that the method for defence should be in line with the one that you have discredited for unarmed defence.